All right. Um, hi, I'm Andy Tolan. I'm an upper school teacher at Groves Academy. I teach um, our executive functioning course, and I also teach Spanish. Hi, I'm Rachel Erickson. I am an upper school teacher at Groves Academy, where I teach um, our executive function class, as well as English language arts. And this is executive functioning in the classroom and beyond. So you're in the right place if this is what you came for. Um, we wanted to start the um, the evening with uh, something that we used to start all of our EF classes with, um, and that is a, a mindfulness activity. Um, we do different mindfulness activities different days. And in fact, right now in the month of March, students are um, keeping a journal and having some class time to work on that. Um, but early in the year, um, we kind of go through the fundamentals of, of mindfulness, which you'll hear a little bit more about in a bit. Um, this is to give you guys something to do and get you used to the idea that you're also participating. And it's also for me to help me uh, chill out a little bit and focus on what we're about to do. So um, I'm going to do something, I think, because I don't think the chime carries very well over a tiny microphone. Um, I'm just going to do something that's called the grounding exercise, or we also call it five, four, three, two, one. So I'm going to invite you guys to take slow, deep breaths in through your nose if that's comfortable um, at your own pace, but just slow your breathing down and really feel what it feels like to breathe in and out and just enjoy the feeling of your breath. And since so much of mindfulness is about being fully present in the moment um, and a lot of the information we get about that moment is from our senses, I'm going to invite you to open your eyes if they're closed and um, glancing around you, try to notice five things that you can see, maybe five details in your everyday environment, because um, I assume most of us are in places very familiar to us that um, you maybe never noticed before. Like I never noticed that um, there's a rip in the corner of this box I'm looking at. Um, little details like that. So look for five things, five small details. And then scan your environment for four things you can hear. I can hear the fan of my computer. I can hear my sad cat in the other room. Maybe you can hear other things. Now, three things from your sense of touch, including your feeling of pressure, or hot and cold. So I'm feeling my body pushing into the chair. I'm feeling a little itch underneath my arm. Um, and my fingertips are cold for some reason. Two things you can smell. And one thing you can taste. And this is an activity that um, you can do in public, in front of people, no one will know you're doing it. You can do it very quickly. Um, and it's a very good way to take control back from um, your limbic system, your fight or flight brain, and um, give the reins back to your executive functioning, your um, prefrontal cortex. So that's something that we like to teach in our unit on emotional control. All right, so there's a few things that we uh, are gonna cover with you today. The first is we are gonna talk to you about um, executive function in our Groves Upper School and, and what that looks like from a curricular standpoint. We're gonna also just give you an overview of what the heck executive function is, as well as walk you through a few activities. Um, and then we will give you some tips and, and, uh, and that are pertinent to you if you are an educator, a parent, or a student. Um, and then at the end, we will open it up for questions as well as some additional reading and resources um, that are available to you on executive function. So uh, let's start off um, just with what is executive functioning. Um, it's, it's kind of a hot topic in education right now, but um, it's something that's really relevant for everyone the age of our students, but especially um, a lot of the students we work with. Um, so what is executive functioning? Executive functioning is the brain's ability to coordinate thinking and behavior needed to do things around um, goals and goal setting. So being able to start something to reach a goal, sustaining your attention, being able to monitor your progress and how you're doing and what your thinking is, and being able to make adjustments and fine tune 
what's going on and um, self-regulate in that way. Um, it also includes um, your attitudes and behaviors that you use in order to reach that goal and reach that goal working with other people. We've broken executive function down even further into 11 different components. Um, and I believe that you have a copy of these um, the, all of these as well as the definitions. Um, so metacognition involves thinking about your thinking, self-reflection and self-monitoring. Organization is uh, having a system for keeping track of, of things that could be a planner, it could be your list of things to do, it could be your, uh, your Google Keep and your Google Notes on your phone. Planning and prioritizing. So this is knowing the steps that are required to achieve an outcome and anticipating any obstacles. So for students, that's what do you need to do to be able to study for that test or what are the materials that you need in order to complete that trifold project uh, that uh, is due in your social studies class. Um, Sustained attention, so paying attention for extended periods of time or until your task is done despite distractions and knowing what triggers you um, that prevents you from sustaining your attention as well as thinking about working in intentional breaks to help you with that attention. And then time management, so making sure that you are effectively working towards your goals and using your time to your advantage. Another one of the skills um is emotional control. Um, and I think oftentimes people think of that in terms of um, like being very rational and bottling up your emotions. Um, and it's really almost the opposite of that. It's understanding what your feelings are, labeling them and not letting those feelings get in the way of reaching that goal. Um, a lot of times your emotions are giving you useful information that can help you reach that goal and being able to tap into that is helpful. Um, response inhibition, uh, people also call it impulse control. It's not saying that really clever, but slightly mean thing you wanted to say, um, controlling your impulses, thinking before you act. Um, it's something that a lot of teenagers have trouble with. It's something that a lot of people with ADHD have trouble with. And we have a lot of teenagers with ADHD. So this is one we hit pretty hard. Um, working memory is just how much stuff you can keep in your head at lunch or <laughs> at once. <laughs> if you, I, I, was, I was going into the lunchroom. So like, um, if you have a bunch of things in your head at the grocery store that you're like, I want a loaf of bread and some milk and some eggs, and it's kind of how many things you can keep juggling in the air inside your brain at once. Um, and it's not something that can change a lot um, through executive functioning strategies, but it is, but there are strategies to optimize it and make the most of it. Um, Goal-directed persistence um, is that understanding and awareness of what your goal is and that ten tenacity to keep at it and not be deterred. Um, cognitive flexibility um, is kind of the, the counterbalance to that. It's noticing when the plan isn't going to plan and being able to change and adjust um, and go in an unplanned direction. Um, and then task initiation um, is something we're talking about now in, with the ninth graders. Um, we also talk about it as starting the damn thing. Um, sometimes it's the hardest part. Um, of doing something is just sitting down and saying, okay, well, this is the moment that I'm gonna do it. What we're gonna show you now is a fun video that we show to our ninth graders after we introduce them to these nine different uh, or 11 different components of executive function. And so uh, once this is done, we're gonna invite you to, in the chat function, let us know what executive function skills you think that these two individuals need some support with. That's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello? There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now. Would somebody please do something? Help! 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 <laughs> I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, there's not enough left to do, is it? Oh. 
Hello? Hey, don't worry about it. I'll fix it in a second. <laughs> he said he can fix it. <laughs> All right. All right. That's more like it. He says he can fix it. I think I've seen this video probably 40 times now and I still kind of chuckle every single time but I watch it with a new eye now and I keep thinking like well at least they're socially distanced on this episode <laughs> right even though they don't have their masks on they're socially distanced um so we would uh we'll open up the the or the chat is open but just uh if you could we'll give it about 30 seconds if you could go ahead and uh let us know what executive function uh, components do you think that these two need some support with? Um, your different options are metacognition, organization, planning and prioritizing, sustained attention, time management, emotional control, response inhibition, working memory, goal-directed persistence, flexibility, and task initiation. All right. Anne Hansen says that uh, emotional control, I think the actors probably needed emotional control not to crack up when they were filming this. Right. Goal-directed persistence, flexibility. flexibility. Problem solving, flexibility, situational awareness, nice, nice, get emotional control, yes. Um, and if this were the class, you would be raising your hand uh, and you would all be talking about why you think that it is, you know, the different component that you chose, and we would be telling you that you are all right and asking you to back up why. There's so many different options with this, um, and that's one of the pieces that is um, so key to our executive function course as well is the discussion and the the, the debate that happens and, and talking about why, because again, there's more than one right answer here. So thank you for participating. Oh, we don't need to watch it again. As funny as it is, here we, we go. Could, we could, but yeah, yeah. So why did we develop this course four years ago, Andy, four years ago, five years ago? I don't know. This is still my second year of teaching. So no, yeah, oh, it was it was like five years, ago. five years ago. So why did we even do this? Um, one of the big uh, reasons that we did this was we as Groves teachers had been doing this kind of behind the scenes forever. And it was it worked into it was kind of just known to all of us as our hidden curriculum and something that we worked with students on all the time, except we decided, why are we thinking of it as our hidden curriculum? This is what we want to be very explicit about uh, because this is such a need for all of our students. But as educators, this was an area of strength for us. And so why weren't we focusing on it? Um, and so it was really to address this need that we were seeing in our students and we had been seeing um, and giving clear language to it uh, to help all of our students to know uh, the skills and to have the vocabulary around it. Um, and so we were then able to take like the, the why do students need this and how can we help them work it into not just being a better student, but as they think about their life after Groves as well. Um, and so we are just very intentional about it and very consistent in the language that we use and, and throughout all of our classes, not just in our executive function course. So as we started to think about what we would want out of the kind of ideal EF course for our students, um, we started thinking about well, what are the outcomes that we would want to see? What would we want kind of across the board for both ninth graders all the way up to you know rising seniors? Like what do we want them to be able to do once they leave our hallowed halls? And um, we came up with these kind of outcomes. Students will understand their own executive functioning. Um, so it's um, pretty individualized, especially um, in 10th grade. And then um, I think 11th grade and 12th grade in different ways, but um, kind of the theme of 10th grade is um, who am I? So um, it's kind of how do the concepts I learned as a ninth grader apply to me? But there's this is sprinkled all the way through too. Um, the students will be able to select strategies that they know work for them. So we're exposing them to um, a wide variety of EF strategies and giving them enough time with each one 
that they get a real sense of whether it works for them and getting past that initial learning curve of like, well, I tried it for five minutes and it didn't help me, so I'm never going to do this again. Um, and students will engage in discussions and focus on how their brain works and um, understanding that executive functioning is something that happens um, largely in the frontal lobe and kind of how the frontal lobe communicates with the rest of the brain and um, how like what's going on in your body literally affects your mind because your brain is in your body. Um, expanding and understanding the purpose of school and how they approach learning. Um, you have to go to school in the United States. Um, so it can be a de facto jail if you want it to be, but there is a purpose behind it. It's not just a jail or a playground or babysitting. There's a lot of learning that could happen. And that starts to get exciting, especially for teenagers when um, they get the sense that there's something after school that they're maybe learning things for. Um, and that's so learning how to apply some of these strategies, not just to school situations, but to novel problems and situations, being able to evaluate new tech tools, especially technology tools that maybe even haven't been invented yet to figure out if they're the right thing for students. Um, and then students will explore their own interests, possible future careers, and the, again, that sort of life after growth concept that um, I think especially kind of at the start of this course, this concept's really terrified a lot of students. And now um, a lot of our 11th and 12th graders are excited um, for what's next. I think hopefully they'll, they'll miss us, but they also are, they have something lined up and they're excited about what it's gonna be. So we wanna tell you a little bit more about um, what EF actually looks like at, in our upper school. So some of the like what that we do in our uh, in our executive function curriculum, um, some of it is the same for all four years. Uh, so we started today with a mindfulness practice, and that is we we do that for all four years. And we actually, as executive function teachers, are very cognizant about um, the routine and the repetition that we do. And so uh, Andy talked about this month is. Uh, mindfulness journaling. And we are doing that regardless of if you are a ninth grader or a senior, because it's kind of fun then for students uh, to chat with their with their friends who are in other grades to, uh, you know, kind of compare notes about, oh yeah, what are you doing? Because the content that they're doing otherwise is different. And so this is one of those uh, community building activities that, that everyone is participating in. There's also this shared language around voc uh, around executive function vocabulary. And so once they learn it as a ninth grader, it comes up again in 10th grade and 11th grade and 12th grade. And it doesn't just come up in this executive function course. Uh, Mr. Tolan is using it in his Spanish class. I'm using it in my English class. And I'm being very explicit about the strategies and using that vocabulary so students are seeing it across the curriculum. We also talk a lot uh, to students about having a growth versus a fixed mindset um, and what that means. And so you might struggle in math now, but that doesn't mean that you you can't work towards that uh, and, and changing that. Um, we do a lot with connections to the brain and how the executive function um, and teaching about the prefrontal cortex and how that's growing and, and changing. Um, and then independent and group applications. So, so much of um, the work that we're doing is students connecting with each other, doing some small group work, large group work in academic settings, in real world settings, it, allowing them to be creative and use technology in new ways to, to share their learning. Um, we also have a service learning component, um, and then writing and self-reflection are, of course, worked into this as well. All right. So one of the things Rachel mentioned is mindfulness, and um, mindfulness is really kind of making space to be able to um, use your executive functioning in the present moment, um, being fully aware of what you're aware of. Um, so mindfulness practice has huge benefits, um, not just for students in school, but for everybody. Um, and th these are all kind of based on the findings of peer reviewed studies and um, Western medical and psychological journals. Um, so it reduces stress, anxiety, and fatigue in the short term and in the long term. Um, and it increases your ability to learn, um, not only um, the exercise itself, letting um, you either self regulate up or self regulate down to where you need to be to be learning, but um, the attitudes of mindfulness include the novice mind or the beginner's mind, the idea that 
like a, a, a full cup can't accept anything new. You have to um, kind of approach things, even things that you may be an expert in as if you've never heard about them before um, in order to discover that thing that's new about them in order to discover that little tear in the corner of the box that has sat on your desk for a year and a half, but you know, whatever that is and whatever you're learning about. Um, and it, it increases compassion um, for yourself and for other people. And um, we have really sweet, compassionate students. Um, and oftentimes the hardest thing for them is that self-compassion. So we've, especially um, during the pandemic era, we really um, emphasized the skill and practice of self-compassion. Um, there's three important components um, about mindfulness that support EF in particular. And the, this is kind of based on um, the definition of mindfulness that John Kabat-Zinn uses. So um, paying attention on purpose, um, focusing on the present time and the present place and um, doing so without judgment. So not without judgment of your surroundings and without judgment of any thoughts that might pop up. If you're noticing that, hey, I'm not really focused right now, I'm not doing this mindfulness exercise very well, that noticing that is not going well is mindfulness. So you're actually doing it well. Um, so yeah, like I said, it's supported by research. It has immediate and long-term benefits. And um, luckily for us, the practice is easily integrated into a school day or even into your life. Um, it's like brushing your teeth. You probably spend, hopefully spend at least five minutes a day brushing your teeth. Um, spending five to 10 minutes a day practicing some of these things will um, reap re benefits, not just for 13 year olds, but for you guys. So this is a quote I wanted to share. Um, it's one of my favorite ones about mindfulness. Mindfulness is the act of thinking about who you are in the present moment without judgment on your thoughts. And this was by one of our ninth graders. So I'm, I really like it because it really sums everything I just said on the last slide up really well. And because I'm so proud of him because he really understood what we were talking about. Um, <clears throat> sorry, another um, kind of important uh, concept that we start the year with, um, especially um, with our ninth graders when they're first coming up to the upper school um, is this idea um, of growth mindset, this idea that um, you have um, beliefs about success or beliefs about your, your intelligence or beliefs about your abilities that affect your ability to use them. Um, so internally, um, your mindset, either a fixed or a growth mindset, and I'll tell you a little, little bit more about what those are in a moment, um, influence your beliefs, your focus, or your attributions to so the stories you tell yourself about yourself. And those things, kind of manifest externally too. So the amount of effort that you'll do something that's difficult or do something that you're not sure will work out, um, the way you conceptualize about obstacles, whether you view them as setbacks or challenges, whether you view them as opportunities to grow or things to avoid, mistakes, whether you view um, errors or um, maybe even huge goof ups as things to avoid, to save face or things to embrace and learn from. And then how you approach corrective feedback, how you, uh, or, or even positive criticism. Do other people have something new to tell you? Is it threatening that someone is coming to you and saying, hey, it was pretty good, but this, this, and this? Or do you say like, yeah, I, I noticed this, this, and this too. Um, so we talk a lot about that at the beginning of the year. And a lot of this terminology um, gets embedded throughout. Um, students have a lot of opportunities for growth. Um, I'm just checking the chat real quick. And the piece about mindset too is really fun because students will sort of check each other. Um, yeah. Like, oh gosh, you know, Ms. Erickson, I'm just, I'm not good at reading. And a student will jump in, you're, you know, Mr. Tolan, you're just not good at reading yet, or you just haven't found mm -hmm. the right book yet that you've really embraced. Um, and so that's really fun to see them embracing it and using it um, and helping each other too. Yeah. I'm having trouble, there we go. <laughs> 
Um, another piece that's embedded into our executive function course is the opportunity for volunteer work and, and service hours. And we really uh, feel strongly about this as upper school teachers is, is getting students out into their, their local community because there's so many reasons why this is great. Um, just, just is housed so well within executive function. The first is that it's just such a practical application to students' skills. Um, they're working on time management. Wow. If they know that they're volunteering on Saturday morning for three hours, what does that mean then in terms of Friday night? Or if they know they're volunteering on Wednesday nights with their youth group, what does that mean for planning ahead in terms of their homework workload or connecting with teachers? Um, they have to be organized in order to do this, thinking ahead about how are you gonna get uh, a ride from point A to point B? Um, or how are you gonna make sure that you've connected with your parents to make sure that they're around to, to help support that? As well as goal-directed persistence, because sometimes finding these service opportunities um, wasn't always the easiest pre-COVID, during COVID and even now kind of as we're, as we're uh, getting out of it, it's looked a little bit different. So I would also add cognitive flexibility to this um, as well over the past couple of years. We really want students though to uh, get out and discover some interests and some passions that they feel are worthy of their time and energy. Um, and it also adds skills uh, and, and items to their resume to help as they're finding future jobs, internships, uh, as well as looking ahead to post-secondary and college um, opportunities. So for our ninth grade group, we ask, we're asking them to do 20 hours of service during the school year. For 10th grade, it's 30. For 11th grade, it's 40. And then for 12th graders, it's 50 hours. Um, this has changed and evolved so much over the past two years with COVID. Um, and much of what we have asked students to do then is to really think about how they are uh, helping and supporting their families and what they're doing that's going above and beyond. Uh, what their normal chores and tasks are around the house. Um, so kind of in, in the beginning of COVID, this was like, how can you help your family? Maybe that's with mowing the lawn, maybe that's with uh, making a meal. We, the very, when COVID first happened, we had a senior who helped uh, his dad re-sheetrack the basement uh, and paint the basement. Um, and it was taking pictures of the progress throughout. Um, other students had really supported their neighbors in doing some, um, uh, some raking, some snow removal, um, helped grandparents with grocery shopping. And so this has really changed and evolved and what it um, initially looked like was so awesome. Um, we had students who were volunteering with the Humane Society. We had students who were organizing with their friends and going on the weekends to feed my starving children. We had, um, we had students getting involved with um, kind of some other like environmental groups. Um, and so it was really, really cool to hear and, and see what students were doing. Um, with this. And that's something that we hope that we're really going to be able to get back to uh, next year with having students get out in their local communities um, and really being able to like beef up their resumes more than they've been able to in the past two years. I'm looking for something wood to knock on here. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Um, so it all starts with ninth grade. Um, and ninth grade is about um, learning or relearning how to do school and think like a student. We think we're funny, so we think of our ninth graders as the new kids on the block. Um, our first unit is just kind of what we're really compressing right now um, until a night over the course of two or three or four weeks. What is executive functioning? What are mindfulness? And, and really spending enough time with the concepts of growth and fixed mindset so that they're not only understood in the moment, but they can sort of follow us throughout the year, like Rachel said. Um, our second unit is about cognitive flexibility and emotional control. So that ability, again, to um, change course, to recognize that things aren't working and switch things up, um, being able to recognize what your emotions are and being able to decide what to do about it, building that space or that pause between an impulse to react and then choosing what you want to do to respond. Um, our third unit is response inhibition and goal-directed persistence. So controlling that impulse and working towards that goal and um, sticking with it as long as you need to in, uh, in order to get there. Um, 
unit four is sustained attention. Um, so being able to direct your focus to where you want it as long as you want it is I guess the dream, but I don't think I don't think any of us are quite there yet, like including myself. It's 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 that novice mindset. You're we're, we're constantly getting better at it. Um, and um, and motivation. Um, and then our um, our last unit before we change gears um, about midway through the year is about time management and planning and prioritization. So here's the gear change I was talking about. Um, several years now, um, the uh, guest speaker at our Groves Gala was um, Dean Bregonier. He's an entrepreneur with, with dyslexia who um, has designed this curriculum for um, specifically for students with dyslexia, but we've um, worked with him to adapt it a little bit for um, for our for our group, which includes um, individuals with dyslexia, but also a lot of other um, learning differences or executive dysfunctions. So um, he was a TEDx speaker. He's a um, an advocate for people with dyslexia and um, and learning differences across the board. Um, and he has a course called Noticeability. Um, which is uh, the particular one we use is called on entrepreneurs and innovators. So um, students are going to be able to take all those skills they learned in the first semester and work in small groups and apply them. So it's project based and experiential and it focuses again on entrepreneurship. Students will take an idea from like the problem stage to the invent like a concept for an invention and then they'll, they'll go through the development phases and figure out who it's for and tweak it and some of them will even like fabricate either models of it or prototypes for it. And they'll participate in both online modules individually where they're learning about like how to work with people, how to disagree with people without being disagreeable, how to um, compromise or decide not to compromise and work through it. And um, they'll also have time to collaborate on that team learning when they're actually taking their idea and putting it into practice and culminating in kind of a, a shark tank experience that we call Groves Tank. <clears throat> um, he uses um, dyslexia kind of, again, it's his main example of a strength-based account of neurodiversity. Um, and a lot of our students, the first year we did this, were like, well, we don't all have dyslexia. Like, you know, what about me? What's, you know, do, am I special too? And so um, we, we actually did the thing that teachers love to do and say, well, why don't you tell me? And so we had students do a little bit um, of research about um, other kind of unseen disabilities. and found that sure enough, there are neurocorrelates um, of like strengths that tend to correlate with ADHD and strengths that tend to correlate with, um, you know, ASD autism spectrum disorder. So um, it was kind of a, a moment to just be like, um, yeah, people with dyslexia do have these kind of hidden strengths, but guess what, we all do. And um, it was just really excited to be able to share that with them. Um, in 10th grade, which is, um, I don't tell anybody, but it's my favorite year, I think, of EF to teach, um, is about self-discovery and kind of answering a variety of different questions that all are around the, the main question of who am I? So we start the year, who am I as a learner, where we go um, kind of deep in the paint with um, the, kind of the Groves learning profile and um, what it means to have academic accommodations and what the difference between accommodations and modifications is. Um, students go through kind of a master list of accommodations and modifications that we um, tend to emphasize at Groves and sort of highlight and check boxes and reflect about sort of which ones they think they have and which ones they think they would really benefit from and which ones they think they use the most. Um, and then following that unit, we look at um, like this idea that the mind is in the brain. Um, why is my brain like this? So this could be from a disability standpoint, but more than that, it's from a, like I'm a teenager and I have the limbic system of an adult. So I, you know, I'm mad and grumpy all the time, but I have the frontal lobe of a toddler or not a toddler, but like a 10 year old. And so you know, this is like a David and Goliath fight that, you know, David's not going to win. So why is my brain like this? So we look at brain development. They learn some terms from neuroanatomy um, and kind of how it pertains to executive function. And we just finished this in my class, this independent research project. 
answering the question, what happens in my brain when? Um, and the question is students research using um, scholarly articles on Google Scholar and other places, questions like what happens in the brain when I smell French fries or what happens in the brain when I have a crush on someone or what happens in the brain um, when you get startled, but they can be really um, sort of quirky and funny, but they can also be um, like what happens in the brain um, when you have depression or what happens in the brain um, when you have um, obsessive compulsive disorder or what happens in the brain when you take antidepressants. So um, they can be um, really personal and they can be really fascinating research projects. And um, we just finished them, they turned out great this year and I'm really excited about it. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you can tell. Um, and then our, the unit that we just started is our unit on motivation, but um, the driving question is what drives me and, and who can I become? So we look at what motivates us, different theories or models of motivation um, and different strategies for getting motivated when you have to do the thing and you don't really wanna do the thing. Um, we again cover neurodiversity and um, where students do another research um, project this time, um, either alone or in small groups where they um, develop um, a strength-based narrative of themselves. And this is like an elevator speech they could give to um, in a college interview, they could give it a job interview, they could give um, in a um, student support office in college to explain kind of who they are as a learner and what they need. Um, and they'll kind of circle back to this again in 12th grade, which you'll hear about in a little bit. And um, unfortunately, since the brain doesn't really come with a manual, um, we have to kind of do that ourselves for our students. Um, so like I said, we focus on, on the teen brain um, and we um, tr try to explain and have students kind of read articles, listen to podcasts, watch videos to not only explain, but destigmatize sleep habits. Why do they like to sleep in and stay up late? It's not because they're lazy, it's because of the, their circadian rhythm. Why do teens take risks? Well, there's some great hormonal reasons, but there's also um, a great evolutionary reason where like our ancestors probably really needed their kids to start being independent at some point in their lives um, and risk-taking um, is kind of the start to that. And um, we can talk too about what are healthy risks versus what are dangerous risks? What kinds of risks are gonna make you an ambitious go-getter and you know ask that girl to prom and do all that stuff and what risks are going to get you in trouble or get you in jail um and then the ability to plan ahead and why <laughs> teenagers tend to, even the teenagers who are really on the ball tend to not be so great at this um peer pressure why suddenly um after 12 years of you know following mom and dad's lead and really caring about what your teachers have to say how come at 13 like a flip of a switch, suddenly it's it's your peer group that you're interested in and are trying to impress. Um, it's not because of MTV, um, it's because of biology. Um, and then emotional intensity and volatility. Why is it that having the emotional systems of a fully grown adult with all of those, you know, hormones and urges and fears and anxieties and having the frontal lobe of a, of a child um, is so difficult. And I, I think that kind of speaks for itself. Just check and chat real quick. Okay, thanks. Um, so Andy has a, a strong affinity for 10th grade and I love to get them in 11th grade. This is my favorite uh, year to teach because they just start with the enter uh, as an, they're, they're now an upperclassman and they're in at Groves. Um, our ninth and 10th graders take a lot of courses together and then our 11th and 12th graders take a lot of courses together. And so the 11th graders suddenly are thrust into their English class, their social studies class, a lot of times our science class, project-based learning, um, math classes, and especially at the beginning of the year, our seniors are so focused on what are they doing next? And suddenly the 11th graders just kind of grow up really quick and are like, oh, we are going to like get out of here soon. And so this class and the material that we cover is so relevant to them at this age. Um, 
we do a huge unit on college uh, exploration, uh, thinking about different options uh, post-secondary. So it could be college four-year, it could be a two-year, it could be a gap program or a gap year program. Um, and really just thinking about what is it that they want to do right after Groves? Um, and how does that connect and tie to some career exploration? Um, they have spent the first two years in our high school know, getting to know their executive function strengths and weaknesses, who they are as a learner, how their brain works, their accommodations that they need. And so what careers are they interested in and how can they use the first two years to their advantage as they think about um, kind of long-term planning? We also do a lot within resumes, cover letters, interview skills, and bring in some guest speakers to help facilitate all of that. Um, we do a really deep dive as well into leadership, leadership styles of, of other leaders and who they are uh, as juniors and as leaders. Um, they are encouraged to get involved in extracurricular activities this year, whether it's through Groves or whether it's through their outside community um, to, and, and to really help them utilize these leadership skills to see other leaders in action um, and to see that leaders and leadership is not just about having a title and being president of the student council. Um, it's about showing up and, and taking action and working for change. And one of the ways that they also do that this year, and this has been a really cool project that we've implemented kind of since COVID, um, is our research and advocacy project. And it's something that we feel really excited about and passionate about where even once students are able to get out into the community, um, they're still gonna do a, a part of this. Um, and what this looks like is they, they choose a topic. So let's say homelessness, and they do a whole bunch of research on the why behind homelessness. Why does homelessness exist on a global scale in their local community? What are some organizations that are working for change? Um, and then and again, in an ideal world, after they've done all of this research, they put together a project and whether, and students have done this in the past as a video, they've done it as an essay, they've done it as a trifold uh, board, um, and they present to the other, the other EF classes um, about their, their research and advocacy project and their topic. And then in an ideal world, after they've presented it, they will be able to go out and volunteer with those organizations that are helping to fight homelessness, say. Um, and so it's really, really cool in terms of helping them to understand their world and the difference that, and the impact that they can make in it um, this year. It also then is something really cool that they can add to uh, their resume. Um, we had a student write about her experience um, and the research that she did with animal cruelty and volunteering at the Humane Society. She won a leadership and volunteer service um, award through Groves. Um, and, and is now pursuing um, some post-secondary education um, around um, like a vet tech. Um, so there's just been some really cool outcomes um, since we've implemented this. And then because I'm an English teacher, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't have uh, some reading and some writing worked into this. And so I really utilize um, this leadership book um, that gives some really great case studies um, of high schoolers, of college students, uh, of um, even uh, people in their 20s of different leadership experiences that they have had um, that really show students like, oh, wow, I never thought about being an RA in college and how that is uh, considered a leader. Um, and even how it's not about, again, that position or that title, it's about being an individual who has a passion and wants to make a difference um, in, in surrounding yourself with people who are also interested in that way. I'm good on this one, Andy. And then 12th grade, this is another really, really fun year uh, to teach, which is thinking about um, what have you learned over the past three years at Groves and what do you want to leave behind when you uh, when you bust out of this place in you know June of your senior year um, so 11th grade or the 12th grade curriculum I'm sorry I'm distracted by Andy's cats um, well, once well, a year they like to come out and ruin our EF presentation <laughs> Year of this, you will notice Andy's cats are literally like destroyed from the cat. It's, it's crazy. 
pretty funny um, if you fast forward and watch for the cats. So be watching for that now. You guys aren't going to pay attention to a thing that I'm talking about. You're only going to be watching Andy's cats from here on out. But 12th grade uh, is all about legacy and, and what students leave behind. So particularly in the fall, it's a lot of post-secondary planning, getting students uh, applications in for uh, the different uh, opportunities that they have. It may be also doing some college uh, writing, some personal statements, um, working on understanding their learning profile as well and how the different colleges uh, and post-secondary opportunities that they are looking at can really help support them as a learner and, and who they are. Um, it's continuing to hone their resume and interview skills. They do a big research paper. Um, they do some service components. Um, and then kind of starting right after spring break, they do this really cool like ethics study and ethics and debate through film, um, which again incorporates a lot of reading and discussion um, and, and thinking about who they are as they launch into the world after class. Oh, India you're muted. Um, as amazingly well as we plan this course and uh, all of the benefits we've just talked about, there were some amazing unplanned benefits for this course, both for um, our students and for us as teachers. Um, one of our ones for students is just so many students, especially our first year, but every year since as well, realizing, hey, I'm not the only one, not just not the only one who has this label that's been applied to me and my learning, but who's had these experiences of not feeling good enough or not feeling... Um, like teachers or peers saw me or appreciated the things that I was good at. Um, it enhanced our ability to discuss thoughts and feelings, not just in the classroom, but like like the next one in the carpool or in, at the dinner table, parents were saying, you know, he's not just talking about his EF class, he's talking about his other classes too. Um, this matchup that Rachel talked about between career and the EF profile, um, the clear one we started with is the entrepreneurship and dyslexia connection, but um, really just imagining yourself with the brain you're going to have only, you know, eight years old, or what are you going to want to be doing with your life? Um, and a real improved sense of community, but also pride in being a student at our school. Um, and then for teachers, we get to have what we call mission moments as a faculty, um, pretty much on a daily basis. One of the um, six or seven EF teachers is going to say like, I had something really cool happen in class today, um, it, especially designing the course, but at, you know, ongoing weekly meetings give us opportunities to collaborate between departments and get to know um, our colleagues in a new way, um, giving us stronger bonds with each other and with our students and giving us that common language as a community to talk about EF and kind of that permission to go there, if that makes sense. Um, one activity that, Andy, I'm looking at the time, and I think um, I might just talk them through this, and then we yes, might jump over it. So there is a really cool handout that we gave you. It's called the Executive Skills uh, Questionnaire, and this is something that we give to our students every single year. Um, and so by the time I get them as 11th grade, they're like, this again? Like, yes, this again. Uh, and it is this really fun uh, profile that they do. And, and there's about 30 some questions here and they are asked to, uh, you're asked to rank yourself in terms of like, um, most of the time you do this versus like never doing it. And you, so you can, you can take this yourself. You can take it uh, thinking about yourself as a teenager. If you want, you can do it thinking about yourself uh, now as an adult. And you can answer this and then at the, you, you add up your scores for every three. And then the very last page gives you the answer key for which of the different executive components, uh, you know, these three questions pertain to. And you'll be able to figure out then your executive function strengths and weaknesses. And you have to think about them as they're all just sort of relative um, to each other. Um, so the, the higher the number, um, the the better the strength that is, and the lower the number, kind of the weaker the executive function skill this is. Um, this is one of those that it's really fun to just do and to kind of see where you rank. Um, it's fun to have your kids do too, because it 
can kind of explain a lot of like family dynamics and relationships. If you want to have your significant other do it, it it's great for, you know, marital counseling and stuff too. Um, when I first started teaching this course, my husband was like, I'm not going to take that. No, 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 no. And a few years ago, he actually, he did it. And he was like, Oh, well, maybe this is why, you know, we, we constantly kind of, um, this kind of fight resurfaces a lot with us and, and stuff like that in terms of um, our, our strengths and weaknesses um, as individuals, but also then like why we're, why we're good together. Um, so, but it's also fun. It's fun for students to be able to think about who they were as a ninth grader and how they have grown and changed um, because they do remember uh, where, where they were. They're like, oh yeah, look, I'm low on task initiation again. No surprise there. Um, but it's fun for them to like recognize that and to uh, be able to, to see this kind of year in and year out. So we would encourage you to, to do this one. It's, it's pretty fun. Yeah, and kind of this is where we go with it in class. So um, it's a good activity to introduce the EF concepts and explore the tone of the course. And it also involves parents as stakeholders because they take a blank one home and have um, you know, an adult at home do it with them. And then they have this fancy little kite diagram that they get to put into Google Docs and they get to have a conversation with that person and say, hey, you know, hey, we both have the same kind of cognitive flexibility, but look at how different we are in our, our approach to time management. That must be why we always argue about, you know, when it's time to leave for school. Um, it, like Rachel said, it promoted discussion and awareness of the EF skills for students who are just hearing about them for the first time. Um, and they they really liked it and they liked talking about it and they liked sort of peeking at each other's and showing them. So it really enhanced student life and community too. So we're changing gears now to talking about, um, I guess maybe this is the meat of it for, for some of you, um, EF tips for educators, parents, and students. So um, Andy and I recognize that we are at this like, amazing microcosm of a school that gives us the opportunity to teach this, to talk about this, um, not just with our students, but as teachers and, and faculty. Um, and so we, we recognize that like this isn't, you know, not every administration is going to be all in on the different um, skills that we're going to suggest here. Um, but some of them, even if you don't have the training, even if your administration isn't on board with teaching this whole full blown course, uh, are things that you can implement in your own classroom um, for your advisory students, for your classroom kids um, that can really like help them and, and, and set them up for success. Um, one of them is really to go slow, to go fast. Um, and so being deliberate and really teaching these skills in the month of September and not feeling like you have to race through curriculum, um, but making sure that you have these like consistent routines and structures that kids are aware of when they walk in your classroom door that they're going to know and get. And so setting up like how and when they receive assignments. Is that the beginning of your class or is it at the end of your class? Is it, um, can, they, can they check uh, your Google Classroom or your Schoology account on, on Sunday night and see kind of a, a look at a glance? Um, and so students thrive on consistency. Um, and so if they know that, that's also gonna take, uh, take the place of, hey, Ms. Erickson, what's the homework for tonight? Ms. Erickson, what's the homework for tonight? Hey, Ms. Erickson, what are we doing today? What are we doing today? And me having to answer that question uh, eight different times before class has started. Spending time breaking down uh, those long-term projects into weekly or even daily tasks. So this is something that I do uh, every year, uh, regardless of if I have a ninth grader or 12th grader, they are doing some independent books for me in my ELA class, and they're doing an independent book project with this. When ninth graders first walk in and I start talking to them about independent reading, um, sometimes there are tears, there's phone calls from parents um, about how nervous and anxious the student is about having to like read this book in seven weeks or listen to the book on Learning Ally in, in seven weeks. Um, but I spend a whole day, particularly for the ninth graders first semester, uh, breaking down, having them pull out their planners. We talk about when assignments are due every Friday, what nights they're gonna spend 30 minutes reading their independent book with, thinking about, okay, if you have, um, if you have your uh, 
course uh, lessons on Tuesday and you have your religion class on Wednesday nights, then maybe those aren't good nights for independent reading. So we're going to have to really plan to do that on Monday and Thursday and one of your weekend days in order to read your goal by Friday and be able to write the summary that is due for me every single Friday. Um, and so they're putting that in their planner so they know uh, what their independent reading is from, you know, September through the end of October. They know the work days they're going to get in class for their projects. They know when they're going to present that project. Um, and again, when I do this for my ninth graders, I, you know, hand them the, the sheet and we go through it. It takes a whole class period. By the time they're seniors uh, and or even sophomores, uh, and I hand them this sheet, they're like, oh yeah, this again. They pull out their planner and they're doing it on their own and planning it out and they're writing it. Oh yeah, that's right. I do have, oh, I have my birthday on this day and so I won't be able to do that. And they're they're like foreseeing all of these obstacles, um, but seeing the workarounds as well and, and uh, the cognitive flexibility and like, okay, if I can't do it that day, I can do it here and here and here. And so that's really cool because then they're taking ownership and doing it on their own. So by taking you know, those couple full court class days to do it early in their ninth grade year means they're doing it automatically and it's taking five to 10 minutes then uh, by, by when they're an upperclassman. Um, as well as then that, that just speaks to kind of that predictability and routine of homework and tests and essays and that, that process as well. I kind of wish I had a horse lesson on Tuesday nights. Um, <laughs> so, um, this is a great one for task initiation that teachers can do just by keeping holding on to things from year to year or, or making examples. Um, this will help everybody, but especially students with task initiation. Um, it's a classic like ADHD inattentive type type problem to run into. Um, provide examples of what done looks like, what finished projects look like. Um, this is um, from this Sarah Ward. If you if you know her work, her playbook is um, show whatever the finished thing looks like. It might be like Rachel saying what a book project looks like um, and or it could be what a, a poster looks like, what a diorama looks like, what an answer to your journal question looks like. If you're having students journal you can journal with them and you can you can share alongside them or show them you know what you wrote this morning when you did the same thing. Um, keeping that exemplar work from year to year and showing them and explaining process wise what's good about them can also make this even more effective. And this is something that um, once you've been doing it for a few years, as long as you can keep teaching the same thing, doesn't require any extra time. Um, one of the most kind of special things about being a teacher, which is also the most terrifying thing about being a teacher is they're gonna be adults someday. And at least in some small part, you're responsible for the adult they're gonna become. So you have to kind of play the long game um, and see them as adults and it's a little easier I guess when they're like 18 than when they're 12 but it's the same thing all along right um so teach that adult that they're going to be model your own metacognition explain the why behind what you're asking them to do and help them um make those connections I think this is something I'm married to a, a first grade teacher this is something first and second grade teachers just do naturally when they're talking about like um the reading skill they're going to do that day they just model their own thinking and like this never goes out of style. Um, explaining how you get from point A to point B in your own head can really help students develop those skills themselves. Um, similarly, on the topic of letting students borrow part of your brain, let students borrow your limbic system or more importantly, let them borrow the part of your brain that can stay calm when the situation is not calm. Um, um, I, calm people, calm people, right? If you're not calm yourself, um, it's going to be hard to help someone else get calm. Um, and just being present, being a calm presence for a student who's having a hard day or is dysregulated in some way, um, this isn't going to be a, like a magic bullet, but it can, can really help. Um, build EF skills and social emotional learning into content area lessons as much as possible. Um, like, like dumb, Mr. Tolan, right? But no, like, give yourself permission and license to do that. And alongside that, do things that support your own social and emotional needs too. Um, you know, the whole cliche about, uh, you know, your own oxygen mask first before helping others um, exists for a reason. And like teachers, we're, we're in a profession that um, a lot of people are leaving and 
um, you guys are at a training on a Tuesday night. And we, we if, if you're one of those teachers who does that kind of thing, we don't want you leaving. We want you in there as long as possible. So take care of yourself. Um, and lastly, um, gradual release of responsibility for kind of any level, but especially middle school, high school, um, with the goal of making students as independent as possible, because once they get their diploma, they're going to be completely independent. And oh my God, um, they don't really, <laughs> trying to, with the goal being as independent as possible all the time um, is like, I guess a good mindset to be in as a teacher. Um, you know, Andy was talking about like taking care of yourself and um, we work on this amazing team where that's one of, you know, the big uh, pushes is what are you doing this weekend? It's taking care of you. Um, it, but one of the benefits that we have seen through this EF course is that we've gotten to know each other. Um, but it's also then allowed us to create these like consistencies into our yearly, weekly, daily schedules um, that makes it easier. Um, and one of the, one of the, the things that our division director does every uh, Monday morning is there's an email that comes out kind of with like key things that we need to remember this week, whether it's uh, the student visitors that are, that are coming, that are touring our, our school that week, our upper school that week, um, whether it is kind of the special things that we might go and have going on uh, next week for student council with St. Patrick's Day. Um, but in, and it's also always putting in there kind of some of these EF things that we just do, but are help us keep it fresh in mind. Remember we're checking planners every single day, every single class. Advisors, did you sign off on your advisees work? Uh, grades, uh, are they updated? Um, thinking about that from task initiation as a teacher, right? When you know spring break is looming, like you just kind of want to get that off your plate um, and, and do that. And so kind of setting up for ourselves as teachers, these different like EF routines that are helpful for us as a team. And then making that really explicit to our students as well. Um, we, we have a, a period before lunch that's called WIN and it's what I need. And recently we started implementing a uh, kind of teacher office hours where we can request students and students can request to come and see us. And when we proposed this to our students, we were we knew this was a change for them, but we framed it around our executive function vocabulary and talking about uh, how this is helpful from a planning and prioritizing standpoint, how this is helpful from a time management standpoint, how this is helpful from a task initiation standpoint, um, as well as getting you to think about this is who you're going to you know, when you're when you're going to college, this is like office hours for for students. So getting them to kind of think ahead with that, but by using that executive function vocabulary, all of our students that are like, oh, okay, we see what we're, they're doing here, and all of us as teachers are like internalizing this further as well. Um, another time that you can work in these executive function skills is, of course, during like an advisory time period or a homeroom time period, and it doesn't have to be that you're doing this every single day with every single student, but if you're being intentional about checking in with them at least once a week, you know kind of to who your uh, students are with kind of executive function challenges the most and checking in with them maybe a, a few more times than you're checking in with the students who seem to be your high flyers. Um, as well as like modeling self-advocacy and communication with them and, and being explicit in terms of like why you're doing this. Um, and then just getting to know them too and, and focusing on their social emotional learning because over the past few years, if we have learned anything as educators, um, it's that we really need to develop those relationships with our students it's to help them with connection. Um, and that's one of the best ways to, to help and support them with executive function because we get to know them deeper um, and start to identify kind of uh, maybe the, the weaknesses that they have within um, executive function as well as their strengths and how we can help uh, support and, and build on them. Another thing that we always need to remember too, uh, regardless of the, the grade that you teach is that you may not see the fruits of your labor. Um, you are putting in all of this time with these amazing kiddos, but their prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed until they're 25. And so you know, some of that organization, that emotional control, uh, that planning and prioritizing, that long-term thinking beyond just you know Friday night, um, 
they're not going to necessarily be able to do that un, until they're adults out in the world. Um, but just knowing that all of those little interactions that you have with students and those check-ins that you do, and that extra kind of minute that you uh, put in to help Paul break down his independent book project, like how much that matters and helps guide them um, as they think about executive function and on utilizing these strategies in their own. I'm just thinking back to the teachers whose names I still remember and whose faces I still remember. And I'm thinking I probably actually thanked maybe a third of them if, if that. <laughs> um, we had a disclaimer at the beginning of the teaching part, knowing kind of how good we have it basically to be able to do a lot of these things in a relatively small class size. That goes double for parents, um, for par the parent stuff. We, we both are parents, but our, our, our oldest kids are like two, three years old. So like we haven't been in this parenting game that long. So this is doing some lateral thinking and like how can kind of some of the stuff that we've been learning as teachers um, also help um, parents because oh, there's a lot of parents here who are interested in learning more about EF and also how they can support their kids. So this is our best shot as parents who are still new at this. Um, so framing your family as a team and like you as a, as a parent being the EF coach, um, celebrating, um, creating a, a family culture of, of failing forward. So like every, um, e even failures are kind of moving closer to the person you wanna be or the goals you wanna achieve. Um, celebrating successes is still important. So if a kid brings, you know, that the, the A on the report card home, that's, that's wonderful. Um, but also important are effort, grit, and growth. So if my kid was getting a, a D and now they're getting a C minus, that might mean just as much as if they got an A last semester and they're getting an A this semester. Um, um, and also recognizing that kids are curious and they don't know anything. And if a kid's asking why, it's often because they're realizing that they don't know everything. And for teenagers especially, that's really great when they realize they don't know everything. Um, so kids can question things, kids can challenge things. And um, when, when that's happening, just make sure that these philosophical discussions about why happen after your expectations are, are set and met and that any negotiations about kind of what expectations might be might happen before those expectations are set. Um, I'm already noticing that this whole philosophically perfect system breakdown with my three-year-old. So um, grain of salt right here. Um, I don't think it matters if your kid is uh, two and a half or 12 and a half. They all crave like structure and routine. Um, and whether that is the chores that they're doing, the uh, daily bath and then brushing their teeth, not brushing your teeth before your bath, because, oh my gosh, um, that could, you know, be the end of the world, right? Um, but just making sure that you have those routines as a family and that if things are changing, that you're being communicative about it because kids really want to know. Um, and hopefully they're doing some planning around, you know, their homework or social time that they're going to have. And so if they can know that the family routine is changing, that's just going to help them um, as they think about kind of the things that and the responsibilities that they are navigating as well. Um, there's also a, a lot um, that 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 parents can do about connecting an undesirable task with like a, a shared goal. Um, this can be something as simple as, um, you know, you're not going to get uh, fruit snacks until after we uh, eat our broccoli and put our plate in the sink. Um, but it can go, it can go bigger than that as well. It can be, you know, we're not going to, we, we have family fun night on Saturday night uh, and we are going to watch a movie and popcorn, but we all have to do these chores uh, first thing in the morning to pitch in um, because we're a family and, and we all help take care of each other. So um, the way you talk about success and um, intelligence and um, skill, um, not only for your child in, in their situation, but how you talk about yourself um, can really influence the way they think about themselves. Um, this goes for 
um, like reinforcement versus punishment. So um, they both work as far as stopping an unwanted behavior, right? Um, but punishment, um, which is like either introducing something that they don't want or taking away something that they do, only tells them to stop. Um, but reinforcement also teaches a skill along with it. It's, it's saying change and, and here's how this is, this is what you get, you know, recognition and reinforcement for. Um, they're both tools. Um, I like reinforcement more not because I'm super nice, although I hope I am, but because um, it is a little bit more kind of control, right? You're not just getting rid of something, but you're saying what you want to replace it with. Um, and when you're talking about success and when you're offering up that praise, there's kind of th three main ways we tend to praise our children. We tend to praise the person that they are. Oh, you're so cute. You're so smart. You're so athletic. And that always feels good. Um, but there's other, maybe more effective ways of praising someone in order to um, connect kind of what they did to get that outcome with the outcome itself. So a little bit better. And what we tend to do as teachers when we're not watching is product praise. Um, oh, that's such a great drawing. Um, oh, you got an A on your test. Oh, you worked, you, you did such a good job on that diorama, it's so detailed. Um, and kind of the, um, the holy grail that I still find myself trying to find ways to work in, um, both as a parent and as a teacher is process praise, um, because it takes the most work because you really have to look and notice what they're doing while they're doing it. But um, describing to them what they did that led to the outcome that they want. You studied every night this week without being asked. Um, it felt really f almost fake to me at first when I started as a teacher doing process praise. And what, what really helped me was that um, kind of <laughs> taking it back a step, um, like saying, oh, I really liked it when you studied every night this week is a little bit like, why are you watching my every move and why are you liking it? But saying I noticed, um, number one, decentralizes you. It's not just about what you like. That's not the reason for doing something but it's just letting them know that you noticed and your notice, your attention is really powerful as a parent or as a teacher um, and, and remembering that. And it's not always about like, I liked it when you, I loved it when you just, I noticed when you um, kind of gives them that agency back on them, but also acknowledges it. Um, I'm trying to say, um, you must feel so proud when what I really want to say is like, I am so proud. Um, and I think there's room for both. Um, I also want to tell my son when I'm proud of him, but um, letting him know that his accomplishments are his accomplishments and not just my accomplishments um, is important, I think. And on that note, um, as far as modeling, um, be the change you wish to see to see in your child, and you know my wife and I are navigating this with screen time and um, and phones, which we'll talk a little bit more about too. But um, model good EF skills yourself. Um, time management. Um, have a family calendar. Explain as you do these things why you're doing these things, and that you need to do things yourself to support your own executive functioning. I think I used to think that every adult just magically knew how to do everything as soon as they turned eighteen and. Um, it turns out in my late 30s that every adult is kind of just as confused as I was as an 18 year old, but has a lot more skills and strategies for coping with that confusion. Um, model your own metacognition too. If you have a difficult decision to make, you know, about some household task or even about your career, as long as it's not too personal, talk them through what you're thinking is and as much as they can understand and you feel appropriate. And even ask like, what would you do? Like, what would you do, Mama? <laughs> mommy has a friend um, at work who's really nice, but always comes into mommy's office and takes all her time when she wants to be by herself um, during the day. What would you do about that? Um, setting time limits on technology use, not just for them, but for you. Try to model that, especially around getting rid of screens close to bedtime. Um, it isn't just about like not wanting to appear hypocritical, but it's about wanting to show them that the things you're telling them are important are important. I don't know. Maybe that's the same concept. I don't know. Um, 
another one, and, and this is not our idea. We actually uh, stole this from our head of school. Uh, and when her son was in high school, this was something that her and her husband did once a week with him. And I think they did it on like Saturday mornings. Um, but they all kind of sat down and they let their son go through and uh, he took ownership and, and showed them his uh, his classes, his assignments, uh, his grade book, and he was able to then talk through it with them. Like, yeah, look at, I, I completed this essay for Miss Erickson and I got a B plus. I'm really proud of that because this was the steps that I went through with it. Or, you know what, mom, I didn't do so great on my math test, but I have already reached out to my math teacher and I'm going to get some extra help on Tuesday before school. Um, and so that was, I think that's just so, such a, a big thing for students, especially if your student is struggling in any academic area or with executive function is allowing them to take ownership and responsibility of it and be proactive in this conversation um, and allow them the opportunity to explain versus as a parent being reactive and like, hey, I notice this as soon as it was posted and you didn't do well, like, what are you going to do about it? Allow them to take ownership and, and to come to you um, or to have that time set aside where they can explain it to you um, without emotions, but giving them that opportunity to take that ownership, um, to really approach this with a growth mindset, to practice some of these organization or some of these uh, EF skills in terms of organization and planning and prioritizing. And at first, there's probably going to be some open-ended questions that you are prompting them with. Um, but our goal is, you know, ultimately for them to take ownership of all of this and to really create that open dialogue with you as parents. Um, and for them as students working on metacognition here and, and thinking about who they are as a learner and what they need to do um, and, and what support uh, they think you can also help provide for them. Um, so just kind of uh, setting time aside for them to uh, show off how well they're doing, but also to, to talk about those moments and those, those opportunities where they, um, they maybe need some additional support and, and help, um, but doing it in, in a way that's like non-judgmental and giving them really the floor and ownership of it um, is, is really good. Students, um, we don't know how many of you there are out there, uh, but um, there are some, these are, we're gonna give you a few uh, EF strategies. Um, and these are all things that we are covering in the span of like, you know, a minute here, but these are all uh, different like units that we go through when we are uh, teaching uh, EF skills. Um, so what I'm about to tell you in, you know, 30 seconds here about SMART goals is really like three or four days in class. Um, and so one, uh, one area of executive function that you can think about in terms of kind of like a longer term uh, project and, and planning things out as well as prioritizing is the idea of creating a SMART goal. So a SMART goal is something that is specific, it's measurable, it's actionable and attainable. So something that you can do, it's relevant to you in your life and it's also timely. So something that you can complete in maybe a couple of weeks to a couple of months. Um, one example of a SMART goal uh, as summer is approaching could be around uh, maybe wanting to save, getting a job and, and saving some money this summer. And so your SMART goal could be something like, I want to uh, make at least $1,000 by the end of the summer. And so is that measurable? Well, yeah, like a, a number like that is very tangible. Um, and so what does that mean then on a weekly scale? Because the summer can be long and, and daunting. Uh, but if there's about 13 weeks to your summer, that's about, you know, $1,000 divided by 13 is about $77 per week. You divide that down even uh, more in terms of how much you could make at your, you know, caribou coffee job. Um, and is it actionable? Yes, uh, because you're going to get that job at caribou or, or Starbucks. Um, is it relevant? Well, of course, every teenager wants some spending money for uh, the ever rising gas prices or uh, to give back to Caribou Coffee in, in the form of uh, all of the, the caffeinated beverages that they need to consume, right? And then is it timely? Yes, you have 13 weeks, you have the end of the summer, you have an exact date um, of when you would need to be done with your summer job because you're going back to, to school in the fall. 
And, and we've had students who probably swore they'd never use a smart goal in the wild, like come back and talk about using these in college. You're like, hey, my professor talked about these, that they're actually real. And we're like, yeah, we know. <laughs> um, technology uh, is such a pain in the ass, um, but it's also the, kind of the way we get everything done. Um, we spent the month of February um, kind of using our phones not to escape from the classroom but to um engage by um you know sending people um positive notes or sharing pictures of times that were fun just not retreating into our phones to play like cookie clicker or you know whatever it is the kids are doing these days but using them to connect to other people um but in addition to that um reducing the frequency that social media apps update is a very concrete thing you can do in the settings so that if you know it's it's not updating um, constantly, but it's doing it every hour, if you just checked it, you're not gonna be as motivated to check it again in two minutes. Um, it takes a while to <laughs> relearn those patterns and behaviors, but let me tell you, um, a lot of phones, um, you can set the color settings to grayscale and turn off push notifications. Um, phones are designed really, really well to grab and keep your attention, but doing things like that can minimize that somewhat. Um, and you can turn the grayscale off when you're not trying to do whatever big thing you're trying to do. Um, using some of those tools that are on your phone um, to your best advantage. Um, online calendars and organizers are something we teach our students to use. Um, and some students like to make task lists or um, use an online planner kind of after they're done with their ninth and 10th grade and have proven that they can do it on a paper planner um, because it's easier, more convenient for them. This is next one is kind of the one that I don't know what I would do if I didn't have my phone set alarms and reminders. Um, if I know in my third period class that I need to do something tonight and that I'll probably forget to do it, I can set an alarm for 415 that just says, remember to do Mr. Gamble's physics problems 12 through 15, right? Um, and uh, this last one's really important and I really fall down on the job here sometimes. Avoid charging your phone in the bedroom and stop using screens at least 90 minutes before pre-sleep routines start. Um, I've heard that ideally it could even be up to three hours as far as melatonin production, but um, I think not, a lot of sleep experts, which I am not, agree that 90 minutes is maybe a compromise that from a public health standpoint, people are actually going to be willing to adopt that change versus very few people would be able to change so that they're not doing it for three hours. Um, this is something we're talking about in ninth grade now, but I think it's really useful for any student or anybody who occasionally has to do unpleasant things or difficult things or things you don't really want to do or have been putting off, which is everybody. Um, figure out when you do your best work. Um, so some people like to eat a frog for breakfast, which means starting the day with the hardest or least appealing task because um, then you know you've already gotten rid of that kind of most difficult thing in the morning when you have the most energy. Other people would look at that and just never even start. Um, and they need behavioral momentum. They need to write their to-do list. And then one of the things on the to-do list is write the to-do list. And as soon as they're done, they check that box. They need that little squirt of dopamine to get the ball rolling and keep that motivation thing. So motivation is something that builds on itself. Um, and for people who um, get the most done this way, they've learned that, you know, I need to start with the little stuff. I need to start the day with the email. I need to start the day with, um, you know, <laughs> putting your name on the top of the paper. Um, and then come up with some consistent after school or um, if you're in college, um, like schedule based um, routine for studying um, where you can be the most productive. Um, if you're a night owl, use that. If you are a morning person, use that. Do um, what works for you and really be thoughtful and practice metacognition to figure out what that is. Be okay owning it too um, and, and whatever it is that, that works for you. I think one of the, the things that our students take away from this class is the ability to like explore that. Um, and if the starting with the least appealing task doesn't motivate you to do it, 
then switching it up and starting with uh, the smaller tasks first is, is totally fine. Um, but also then being able to explain that to other people in terms of, well, this is my learning style or this is what helps me uh, to get things done um, is totally fine. Um, I am somebody, uh, since I was in middle school, where as an English teacher, writing is something that I do when everyone else has gone to bed. Um, as a teacher at Groves, every uh, semester we have to write progress reports for students and I can never do it at school because there's too much going on. Um, and I can never do it when my family is awake. And so for, it's typically me writing progress reports from like 10.30 until 1.30 in the morning on Friday nights and Saturday nights. Um, because that's when I can know that I get to sleep in a little bit the next day. Uh, but also when everything else is kind of turned off and I can just focus on, on that writing task. Um, that was me in college too. I was uh, always doing my writing late at night, um, much to my uh, roommate's chagrin. Um, but that's who I was then and it's still what I do and when I work best with large writing tasks. And if you're not like Rachel and large writing tasks need a little bit of uh, something else to grease the wheels, this is a motivation super tip that I have used um, to great effect. It's called temptation bundling. And if you want to hear someone more articulate talk about it for longer, you should Google that term. It's There's some great stuff out there. But we all have temptations. We all have a Netflix series, a snack that we like, a new video game that we love. Um, I have a podcast that I only listen to when I'm doing things that I otherwise don't want to do. Um, and we all have things that we need to do when we put off. So we can bundle that temptation, that thing we love um, and are definitely going to do with that undesirable or, or low probability task that we maybe wouldn't otherwise do. Um, so we get to indulge our temptation, like having that snack or, um, um, or, or along with it, or we get to do it after it. So we kind of change the like, when I want to watch Bridgerton, I watch Bridgerton to Rachel saying, when I want to watch Bridgerton, I take out the 11th grade term papers and start looking at them. And then I turn on Bridgerton. So she's um, getting to enjoy Bridgerton and only feel a little bit silly about period drama. And she's getting her work done. Never feel silly about period drama. But... No, me neither. Um, <laughs> and this last one, I think you have the Pomodoro cheat sheet somewhere in your materials. Um, I really love this one because it takes the emphasis off of the product, what the kids are working towards and puts it back onto the effort, which is probably where it should be the time you spend doing the thing. But kids like it because they get to take breaks um, and they get to use a special app or use a little thing that goes ding. Um, so this is a technique where um, you have, you think about your work as a series of um, relatively short fixed periods of time. It's usually 25 minutes. Um, so you set up your agenda before starting your work, like what is this huge list of things you need to do? You choose just the top three things on that list that you wanna get done. And you start in with the first one for um, 25 minutes. Um, and my students, I start them at 10 or 15 minutes at first because 25 minutes is a long time when you're a 13 year old with ADD. Um, so after that 25 minutes goes ding and you've been working well that whole time, you take a planned break of five minutes um, once you've done a sequence of these together, you take a longer break where you actually get off your butt and go somewhere else and do something for a while. Um, and again, this is the reason I love this is because it rewards the process and, uh, and the progress and not the output itself. So you can get that little, I checked a box feeling every 25 minutes if you are working well towards your goal for 25 minutes rather than like I only get to check the box after three hours once I finished my first draft for Miss Erickson. Um, so to get more information about this and to see the website, because of course there's a website, um, take a look at the cheat sheet. Organizational system. So this um, is kind of one of those hot button topics um, at every single school for every single student, starting in probably like upper elementary, you know, all the way through to uh, adulthood, right? In terms of how can we keep ourselves organized? And the biggest 
takeaway that we can offer to you as a student or you as an adult even is that you need to spend as much time and energy like maintaining the system as you do initially setting it up, right? So I have uh, this like very exciting um, Marie Kondo, like organizational, like planner, right? I got this. It has all these like fun stickers in it. It that, sparks uh, joy. It does. It sparks a lot of joy. Yeah. Um, and I uh, put all of the stickers in with the dates and all of that. And I got like so excited to do all of this, right? Um, and to, to set it all up and to put all my stickers in. But I also have to make sure then that every day I am coming back to it. I'm opening it to the appropriate spot. Now I lost my, my specific page, but, um, and that I am using it to fill in my to-do list. I'm crossing that off. I'm adding to it. I'm updating it. Um, and this is a way that works for me is I like having the paper piece of it. Not everyone is old school like me and likes the paper piece of it, right? Um, some students really like to use their phone and use Google Keep or to use different uh, like apps and, and to-do lists here. Some students really like to just set things up onto their calendar uh, and to set those reminders. Whatever it is um, and however you you do it we want you to know that there's like flexibility in it but it's something that you have to be willing to keep coming back to um time after time day after day and really using it consistently um, and holding yourself accountable to it because it's one thing to like buy the fancy planner and and convince your parents that you of course need the sticker add-ons right for an extra nine dollars um but then it's another to make sure that you are then using it and using it to your advantage. Um, and another piece that we would encourage you to do is to use a planner, to use online tools, um, not just for your homework and your to-do list, but for also the extracurriculars that you have going on for your practices and your games, um, for the events that you want to go to. Um, as well as for like family obligations, your mom's birthday dinner, social obligations that you might have, work, volunteering, so that you're really able to kind of have your whole life kind of out there and you can see it um, in an organized way, which is going to help you plan and prioritize the workload that you have. So at the end of the day, there are just many options for it, but you have to find and stick to something that, that works for you. And we have so many students who, who start and say like, oh yeah, I've used a planner, it doesn't work. Um, and yet we've had so many students who are like very uh, meticulous about their paper planner and they don't actually then wanna try uh, using any of the other tools because they know that like, nope, this is what works for me. Um, another strategy that we have in this is similar to what we uh, told teachers as well as to be able to show what done looks like. Um, and as students, we think that this is really helpful as well for you to be able to think about, okay, what does the finished product or result look like? And how can I break that into smaller, more manageable tasks? Um, I had this 1500 piece uh, puzzle that I completed uh, uh, last winter over uh, Kind of COVID stuff, right? And so I knew what done looked like, which was this amazing tropical island holiday vacation. And I knew where I was with it. Um, what you don't see in this picture was how I chunked it out. And I was using uh, little like Tupperwares with the different pieces that went with each uh, kind of part based on like the where the sky was or where uh, the flowers were so that I was only looking at certain pieces at certain times and not getting frustrated and overwhelmed with oh my gosh how am I supposed to put 1500 pieces together um, how am I supposed to use five sources and write six pages? Oh my gosh, that's impossible, right? Um, but having a plan and breaking it into those smaller chunks, but also knowing what your end goal is, can be really, really helpful. And, and again, gets back to kind of task initiation, planning and prioritizing, um, goal-directed persistence.
another really fun activity that we do with uh, ninth graders. And we invite everyone to do this, um, regardless of uh, your age as a student or as an adult, is to really think about um, your short-term and long-term goals. Um, and, and what do you want for life? This also kind of gets into a mindfulness activity as well. Um, but really connecting what you're doing today with the goals of tomorrow. And so uh, why are you going to school? Well, it's preparing you for uh, opportunities after school in terms of post-secondary options, um, which then prepares you for work. Um, and, and for a meaningful career. And what do you get from that career? Um, it can be just other choices and opportunities, um, whether it's uh, by saving your money, you can go on vacation, uh, whether it's uh, thinking about the things that you want to fulfill your outside of a career, whether that is personal fitness and health, relationships, connections, um, things that you uh, want or traits that you want to work for, hobbies that you want to take on. Um, and so just really like thinking about and, and being able to visualize this can be helpful for thinking about um, long-term uh, and, and kind of midterm goals as well. Um, when we do this, we have students break their vision board into kind of two halves, one where they focus on the next sort of four to five years, what do they want uh, out of high school? And thinking even beyond then for like 10 or 15 years after that, what do they want uh, in their adult life? Um, and so this is a really, really fun, cool activity that gets students thinking about um, that high school isn't forever and, and what comes next. I'm going to t talk a little bit about kind of options for further reading if some of these things interested you um, and I want some help from Rachel too because she's more familiar with some of these than me. So um, I tell students that Carol Dweck, um, who wrote Mindset, as a, she's a Stanford psychologist, she's great. She's my celebrity crush is what I tell the students because um, her research was really important to me in my academic career and also I just think it really has an impact on our students. Um, so that's a great one. You'll notice a number of these books are co-written by Peg Dawson and Richard Guare, who are kind of the it people as far as um, bringing executive function concepts into the school setting. Um, the, the Academic Planner um, is um, pretty neat. It has a, a section at the beginning that goes through the same EF questionnaire that we gave you guys just now, um, which we feel okay about because we're also advertising their book. Um, and whoa. And it has um, tips for specific EF skills. Um, it has um, different types of planners for different assignments on bigger, bigger, and, bigger and smaller scales. And it has like a day planner and a week planner. Um, and it, um, you can do it um, just by yourself as a student. You can do it with a teacher or a parent or a, an academic or ADHD coach. Um, and it really is a pretty functional document. Um, if you are interested in how awful communication technology is at sucking your attention and then keeping it there and what we can maybe do about it. Um, this is more like a popular science type book, kind of like, like a Malcolm Gladwell or Stephen Pinker type book, but it's really interesting. Um, and it also has a lot to, to say about, you know, screen time and how it's maybe not the best thing for, <laughs> for any of us, let alone kids. Um, but it also has a, some notes of hope and acknowledges that you know, technology is kind of what we've got. Um, you already talked a little bit about this book. Anything to add about it? I uh, know. I think it's just it's uh, really great. I think more for uh, upper high school age because the case studies are either uh, high school students or college um, and, and students in their twenties. And so, uh, as we know, we always want to be looking ahead and, and reading about people who are doing things in the next stage of our life. So I think that that uh, that's more relevant for kind of that age group. Um, the executive skills in uh, children and adolescents is awesome, uh, particularly if you are in special education and you're writing IEP and five. Four goals um, because there's some really great ones kind of um, 
uh, laid out there. Um, so, so for educators, that's a really great one too. And then uh, somebody who I'm incorporating more into 11th grade executive function uh, is my celebrity crush, Brene Brown, um, who has tons and tons of books um, that are helpful for kind of any stage of life. But I think Darren Greatly has been one that we've used with different excerpts from. Um, we've listened to her TED Talks and, and uh, whatnot. And so she has some really great stuff on, on leadership as well. I just realized that both our celebrity crushes have sold 2 million copies. Yeah, I mean, there's not, it's not a competition. Um, and then lastly, the, the brain that changes itself as a great book of, um, that just kind of breaks down the pretty complicated brain science of neuroplasticity um, for like a kind of interested, educated lay reader. And it has some really interesting case studies that illustrate its points um, and some ideas about how to apply some of this to learning, uh, either your own learning or um, an educational setting. Um, I really enjoyed reading it and it's something I go back to from time to time. All right. We did it. Um, questions? Yeah, open up for some questions. I know I'm kind of throughout. There was um, some questions about, um, you know, are there any EF courses um, or like kind of mini classes that students can be taking? Um, and we will give kind of a plug in the summertime. Uh, Groves uh, has some really robust uh, summer school opportunities. And um, one course that, that we have for sixth through eighth graders, as well as for ninth and 10th graders is an executive function and writing course. Um, summer school applications are, are, we're currently accepting summer school applications, I believe through mid-May and they're kind of on the first come first serve um, basis. And so I know um, you can get some of that by just uh, learning more about those, those programs and those courses um, through uh, our Groves uh, Learning Organization website and typing in uh, summer school. Any other cues? Well, if you do have any cues, um, you can get in touch um, with us through our um, our work emails. You can find them on the Groves website. I'm Andrew Tolan. This is Rachel Erickson. Um, we um, thank you very much. Um, and uh, if we don't know, we'll figure out who does, or we'll um, happily admit that we don't know because we are experts in our course, but we're not experts in executive functioning. We just are. Um, self-educated and, um, and, and, and a well-trained, I guess I would say. Oh, thank you. Thanks for uh, staying up this late with us. Um, before this webinar started, um, Joanna, Andy and I all have, have uh, kids under four. And so they were all chatting with each other in, in their pajamas and, and getting ready for bed. And we're like, oh man, and we still have to like, you know, work starting at seven and our, our kids are uh, long, long asleep by now. So thanks for staying up with us. And if you just stuck around to see what my cats would do next, you can, you can post that in chat and, and own up to it. All right. <laughs> All right, um, keep an eye on your emails for uh, tomorrow. You'll get an email from Zoom about um, a follow-up survey as well as a link to where we have all of our workshop recordings on our YouTube channel. Uh, so those are all available to you. Um, they should be available starting tomorrow afternoon. And um, again, if you are an educator, just reach out to me and I am happy to get you those um, continuing ed credits as well. So thank you again so much. All right.